This is the video of my blog post about a visit to the Modern Art Foundry in New York City on September 19th, 2019. I lived in New York City for three decades without suspecting that the Modern Art Foundry was casting bronze sculptures just a few miles from my home. Most famous among them is probably José de Creef's Alice in Wonderland in Central Park, but the foundry has been at work since 1932, so there are many, many more of their works in New York City, around the country, and around the world. Last week I toured the foundry while several sculptures were being cast. It was a fabulous day. Many thanks to Jeffrey Spring, who runs the foundry with his sister Mary Jo, for taking the time to show us around. Thanks also to my friend G.A. Mudge for making the arrangements for our visit. The photos in this video are from that visit. They're also a short course in the lost wax process, which has been used for millennia to create metal sculptures. If you're on my Sunday recommendations list, the URL for that is at the bottom of this image, you've seen quite a few works created by the lost wax process. Okay, first is the preparation for casting. A sculptor brings a model to the foundry. It might be made of plaster, clay, wood, or some other material. In the case of the example that's being shown here, it was a microphone base. At the foundry, the first step in making a bronze sculpture is to make a rubber mold of the model. That's the pink thing in the photo. From this point on, I'm only going to be mentioning casting in bronze, but the foundry also casts in several other metals. The inside of the rubber mold is then painted with a quick drying red wax that captures all the detail on the surface of the mold. On top of the red wax goes a layer of thicker brown wax. The brown wax dries from the mold side inward. As soon as the dry layer is about a quarter inch thick, the rest of the wax that's not yet hardened is poured out. So this double thickness of wax, the red plus the brown, is eventually going to be the thickness of the finished bronze. In the photo on the right, the rectangular red object in the foreground is a red and brown wax piece that was created from the pink mold at the left. And on the right, the far right, the pink mold is partially filled, just for demonstration purposes, with a thin layer of red wax and then a pool of brown wax. The rubber mold can now be peeled off. At this point, the sculptor might come into the foundry to check that the red wax has all the detail that he wants, because in the next steps, his work is going to become difficult and then impossible to see. The molten bronze will eventually be poured into the shape of the wax. To allow that, wax gates are attached to the red wax. The object in this photo is a seated human figure who's leaning slightly forward. The rubber mold for this sculpture would have been made in several different sections from the artist's original model. That brown shape at the top, up here, is a Starbucks cup covered in brown wax. That will eventually form the pore spout, the hole where the bronze is poured in. So most of the gates lead down from it. You can see they go down here, and here, and here. As the molten bronze flows into these gates, these red tubes, the air within the gates has to be able to escape. So in this photo, the gates that emerge from the Starbucks cup go directly to the bottom, all the way down here. But the gates that branch off of them, like this one, this one, this one, this one, are pointed upwards, so the bronze can't flow into them until the area below them is filled and the air is pushed out. As the air is getting pushed out, it escapes through these two gates at the very top. The figure on the left has been filled with crushed refractory material. It's this white stuff visible right here. Refractory material just means stuff that doesn't care if it comes in contact with 2000 degree Fahrenheit molten metal. Steel nails are driven into the wax and the crushed refractory material behind it. 
Steel doesn't melt until 3000 degrees, so the nails aren't going to melt and mix with the bronze. In this figure, you can see nails sticking on the knee and elsewhere. On this piece, they're a lot easier to see because it's much flatter. Next, the red wax is carefully covered with a layer of refractory material that's been mixed into a slurry, the consistency of sour cream. The inside of this layer is going to give the exterior of the final bronze its shape, so it has to be applied very carefully to capture all the details of the red wax, which you remember was applied very carefully to capture all the details of the original model. After this fine layer of stone is applied, layers of coarser stone are added until the shape is barely recognizable. In this piece on the left, a thin layer of refractory material has been applied, and the spout and air vents are still visible up here. These are the three different consistencies of, of uh, ground up refractory material. This figure on the left has more refractory material applied to the outside. This is not the same figure that we saw earlier in red wax. It's just another one that happened to be in progress the day that I visited. The whole business, the inner core, the wax, the nails, the outer core, now gets framed into a box of concrete panels. All the gaps within that box are filled in with a wet mixture of ground up stone refractory material. Why? Because molten bronze would very much like to flow all over the place and the compacted stone is going to keep it from doing that. The sculpture is now completely unidentifiable within its concrete box. It's labeled on the outside with the artist's name and the weight of bronze that it's going to be needed to fill it. That weight is calculated by keeping track of how much red and brown wax it took to create the wax model. Okay, last step before the casting. The concrete box is put into a furnace for a day or so. The wax all melts out. The core, the exterior, and all those steel nails keep the space where the wax was, where the air now is, exactly where it ought to be so that inner core can't shift around. In this photo, you can see the wax puddling out down here at the lower right. Okay, now we are at the pouring stage. The day that I visited the foundry, they were casting two small pieces and one larger one. In the photo below, the molds are here in the foreground. Small, small, large. The staff places a graphite crucible. It's uh, sort of egg-shaped back here. They put it in a furnace and they fill it with bronze ingots enough weight for whatever they're casting that day. When the ingots have melted, the crucible is lifted out with a massive pulley. You can see that here. Bronze is an alloy, and when it's heated, some impurities will rise to the surface. So in this picture, a staff member is just scooping those off and tossing them on the ground. Then the staff moves the crucible toward the first mold. And here they are pouring it into the mold. When the steam no longer emerges from those two vents at the top, then they know that the mold is full. Here they're moving the crucible to the largest of the three molds. The man closest to us here is holding one of the two handles that let them tip the crucible once it's in the proper position. I'll show you that in a moment. If the mold is very large, then it's set into a pit in the floor where the surrounding concrete and ground can be used to help support it. The bronze that is left over in the crucible after all the molds are filled is poured into ingot molds, these things here. The ingots can be used in future castings along with virgin ingots, such as this one. Within a couple hours, the crucible will have returned to its normal gray color. The bright white spots here are not heat, but sunlight coming through the roof. In this picture, most of these crucibles would hold 250 pounds of melted bronze. This one would hold about 350. And over here is one of the two handles that goes underneath. Oh, you can see it here. The, there's a circular frame here that 
holds the crucible and then a man on either end tilts these handles and pours it. The molds that have just been filled will sit for a day or so so that the quarter inch thick bronze can cool. If the bronze were a solid piece, if they poured it without just the outer shell, the cooling process would take a lot longer and it would cool unevenly, creating cracks and pockets in the middle. You've probably seen that if you baked a cake and it cracks while it's cooling. And the sculpture would be enormously heavy and very expensive as well. When the metal has cooled down, the outer shell, the refractory material, is smashed away. These ridges that you see here were once the red gates attached to the wax, and now they are bronze. This is another piece which still has its gates attached, and this is a huge pile of smashed up refractory material that will be ground up and used for cores in future sculptures. Okay, now we're at the finishing part. In this one, all of the refractory material has been cleaned off, and Jeffrey Spring is showing us where the bronze gates will be removed. Uh, he's also showing, I don't know if you can see it, there's some lacy bits where the refractory material didn't quite fill in solidly and the bronze tried to seep out. The bronze that's removed, the gates, the lacy bits, whatever, is saved for future use. And then the piece goes into a sulfuric acid bath to clean it even further. This piece, it's an upside down horse. It's part of the Breeders' Cup Trophy, uh, of which they make many copies every year. The sulfuric, sulfuric acid bath turns the bronze kind of pinkish. In the next stage, a member of the foundry staff repairs the areas where the gates were detached, also repairs any minor flaws in the casting. The interior core is removed at this point. If it's not, and the sculpture is placed outdoors, the refractory material starts to leach through the bronze and discolor it, so you don't want the refractory material left inside. In this photo, the standing figure has been finished and a patina has been added. This is a piece by the same sculptor that is still waiting to be cleaned up. A patina is not an added layer. It's a chemical reaction with the outer layer of the bronze. Uh, the, the foundry has a wall full of options for the patina on your piece. This is from one of the last rooms that we saw in the tour. It's a work by Charles E. Gagnon called the String Quartet. Gagnon, who lived from 1932 to 2012, was inspired to do this by his love of string quartets. He created these four life-size figures, which the Modern Art Foundry cast. I can almost hear the music. Here are two more details. And when I was approaching the foundry up 41st Street, I saw these, these figures, figures up here on a shelf, and it turns out that they are a couple more copies of the string quartet. This is the Modern Art Foundry's logo, cast in bronze. Today's protective gear is a bit more all-encompassing than that. Uh, I've given you the Modern Art Foundry's address and its contact information on here. If you're interested in a tour, get in touch with them. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, Central Park, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL online or just email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on dianedurantywriter.com. Thank you, as always, for listening.